And we are joined today by our presenters, Dr. Carrie Chapman, Dr. John Kennedy, Dr. Lou Schoen, and Dr. Yoshiharu Shumasono. And at this time, I'd like to turn the microphone over to our presenter, Dr. John Kennedy, to begin the presentation. Thank you very much, Eric, and welcome everyone to NYU Langone um, What's New in Foot and Ankle Surgery. We have an all-star uh, lineup today. Um, we have Carrie Chapman, Lou Schoen, and Yoshi Shimizono all talking about very exciting new developments in, in foot and ankle. And our first presenter is uh, Carrie Chapman. Carrie's going to talk about what's new in lateral ligament reconstruction and the modified uh, rostrum groove procedure. So. Uh, without further ado, we'll carry on with, uh, with Carrie's um, talk. And between each talk, what we'll do is we'll go through all the questions and we'll, we'll um, pitch those to the presenters um, so that we'll have a fairly good interactive and robust um, discussion between the talks. Thank you very much, Carrie. All right, good evening. Thanks, uh, everyone, for showing up today. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, what's new in the modified Brostrom. The rostrum has been really the um, gold standard over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, and then Gould, of course, modified that into bringing the extensor retinaculum. Recently, there's been a big trend in trying to do this um, arthroscopically. And, and one of the things that we'll be talking to Carrie about is whether or not there's any great reason for that. If you have outcomes that are almost 95% success with a modified rostrum, so, yeah, as we were saying, that um, the question is, if you have something that does so well um, with an open procedure, a mini open procedure, do we need an arthroscopic um, approach to it? And that's something I think Kerry will be able to answer in this uh, terrific uh, talk that he's just about to, to bring up to us <laughs> now. And that's, that's always the way All right. we, had, we have rehearsed the so well. The suspense is we killing me. All right, great, finally. All right, I'm sorry about that, guys. Right. So I have no disclosures. I'm going to be talking about ankle sprains today. Uh, ankle sprain is the most common ligamentous injury. About 20 to 30,000 ankle sprains occur each day in the U.S., and it's, it's a really common sports injury. About 45% of basketball injuries and 25% of soccer injuries are related to ankle sprains, and it's uh, the most common cause of lost playing time in the NFL. So just a very brief overview of the anatomy. The ATFL uh, is loose in dorsiflexion, tight in plantar flexion. It restricts inversion with the ankle in plantar flexion. It's also the weakest of the lateral ligaments with 138 newton load failure. It does, however, have the greatest strain or ability to deform. The CFL is the opposite. It's, it's, it's loose in plantar flexion but tight in dorsiflexion, so it's going to restrict inversion with the ankle in dorsiflexion and it has a much higher load to failure. What you don't see on here is the uh, PTFL. We're not really going to get into that today, but it's the strongest of the three, and uh, it restricts external rotation with the ankle and dorsiflexion. And uh, just to mention, the inferior extensor retinaculum is not technically uh, a ligament, but it does help with uh, stabilization of the subtalar joint as it blends into the CFL. So uh, most of these ankle sprains involve the lateral ligament. Uh, they're essentially low ankle sprains, and we all know the grading system, one to three, with three being a complete tear. This is manifested with uh, severe swelling and inability to bear weight. Uh, most of these, however, resolve with uh, non-operative treatment, uh, such as what you see over here, um, with, a, with a higher grade injuries requiring uh, some brief period of mobilization. So when is the time for surgery? Essentially, if you have a patient with persistent instability and has tried some form of uh, physical therapy, you can argue whether it's six months, three months, nine months, uh, most of these patients show up to the office, and this, this is something that's been going on for years, and they're finally tired of it. So my workup for surgery, I want to make sure they have an anterior door sign. I, I don't want to mistake uh, functional instability for mechanical instability. I'll get an MRI on all of these patients as well because I want to see if there's any other uh, soft tissue pathology or cartilage pathology, such as an OCD lesion. And in terms of stress x-rays, that really doesn't work for me in my office. Um, I don't have the time to go in and, and turn the ankle joint. I, I don't think it adds that much, but certainly there's uh, much written about that. And things to look out for, you don't want to miss fractures. Um, you don't want to miss the lateral process of the talus or the anterior process of the calcaneus. Um, or a wrist crank injury. And there are certain situations you want to look out for as well, such as generalized ligamentous laxity. If someone has uh, uh, that, 
you're going to need to augment your repair either with an allograft or a suture tape, which we'll get into a little bit later. And another important thing is the cavus foot. Now, this is a very dramatic looking cavus foot, but most of us will see something like this, where it's, uh, it's what's called a subtle cavus foot. Um, there is a uh, orthotic that accounts for this type of foot. It's commercially available. It's called the cavus foot orthotic, and it's something that's going to take stress off the lateral border of the foot after your repair. If you are going to do some type of calcaneal osteotomy or a first metatarsal osteotomy, if you recall from uh, your training, uh, there's a device uh, called uh, the Coleman block or essentially any, any block that you put this on the side of the foot. So without the, without the foot underneath the block, you can see the varus here in the heel. And when the lateral aspect of the foot is placed on the block, it allows the first metatarsal to settle and that allows the heel to go into physiologic valgus. Um, so this is a forefoot driven uh, hind foot varus, and this is a patient you do a first metatarsal dorsiflexion osteotomy on. So in terms of surgical treatment, there is the uh, anatomic repair, which is what we're gonna go over today. Uh, the modified uh, brostrum, or the open modified brostrum is, is really what I still consider the gold standard, but we're gonna talk about the arthroscopic brostrum and the augmented brostrum with suture tape. Um, there is uh, the semi-anatomic semi uh, repair, which is a brostrum with the slip of the peroneus brevis, which was popularized by Bob Anderson. And then there are these historical non-anatomic repairs. Um, now, these, uh, these procedures uh, use the peroneus brevis uh, to recon reconstruct or recreate um, the lateral ligament complex. Uh, they tended to have a higher complication rate with the compared to the brostrum, but good short-term results. But when you looked at these patients five, 10, 15 years down the road, they, they, most of them did not do well because this, this repair restricted subtalar motion significantly and a lot of them developed arthritis. So uh, Brostrom described his procedure in 1966. It uh, is essentially a direct repair of the ATFL and CFL and, and uh, recreates the normal anatomic relationships uh, and biomechanics of the ankle and subtalar joint. Gould modified this in 1980, essentially reinforcing this repair with the extensor retinaculum. And, and Carlson further modified it uh, later in the 80s uh, using um, bone tunnels to repair the ATFL to the fibula. Now, all of these showed really good results. And when looking at, uh, there's a multitude of studies out there that show um, pretty consistent uh, 90 to 95% good to excellent results in the short term and midterm. There is uh, one long-term study of uh, West Point cadets that showed a similar uh, finding of, of great results. So for the modified brostrum, um, I'm just gonna briefly go over how I do it. I'll, I'll pretty much always scope first. There's uh, multiple uh, authors who've shown 90% uh, plus uh, intraarticular pathology. Um, I'll use a non-invasive distractor and after the scope is done, we'll take the patient out of the uh, leg holder and the distractor. And I'll put a bump underneath the distal tibia. This prevents uh, a pseudo anterior drawer uh, maneuver onto the heel. This allows the heel to step back when you're doing your uh, repair. And I'll use a lateral, I like this uh, standard lateral incision. Um, I don't like the, uh, the curvilinear incision because you can't really access the perineal tendons that way. So we'll create, we'll create some full thickness flaps dorsally and, and plantarly. Uh, you should always check out for the superficial perineal nerve. A lot of times it'll be in the dorsal uh, half of the incision. And I'll separate the inferior extensor retinaculum from the capsule here. And then elevate this off of the distal fibula with a two millimeter cup of periosteum. We'll rough up the distal fibula to create some bleeding to allow for some biologic healing. And then we're gonna place two to three small suture anchors at the distal edge, uh, the, the edge of the distal fibula, and then pass these sutures through the ATFL and CFL if needed. And then we're gonna tie down, tie down our ligaments to the fibula and then reinforce, reinforce it further by taking one limb of each anchor and, take, and reinforcing it to a, um, knotless anchor posterior to it. So you have this suture bridge uh, construct. I think it's pretty solid and uh, this is my go-to procedure. At the end, we'll take the extensor retinaculum and just pull it in, pull it posteriorly. So if this is such a good procedure, why 
why bother? Why are we bothering with arthroscopic procedures? Um, I think this is a natural evolution of orthopedic treatment. I mean, if you're looking, if you go back to the 80s or the 90s, most things were done open or arthroscopically assisted, uh, including rotator cuff repairs, uh, capsulography, ACL reconstructions. And then in the past 20, 25 years, all of these procedures have moved to uh, uh, an arthroscopic-based procedure. You may also find that you're in a very competitive practice environment. You need something to differentiate yourself from other practitioners, or you just may have very demanding patients who want the latest and the greatest. So hopefully at the end of this, I'll show you that the, there are equivalent functional results uh, and repair strength between these procedures uh, with the possibility of having decreased swelling, faster recovery, and certainly better cosmesis. So in terms of uh, where's the evidence, the first reported um, paper on the arthroscopic technique was done by Hawkins sometime in the mid 80s, but it really hasn't been until the last perhaps 10 years or so where uh, reports are coming out on this and Cottenham and Acevedo Mangone have uh, two large theories um, showing significant improvement in, uh, in uh, older uh, patient report outcome scores such as the AOFAS and the BAS scores with minimal complications. In the last few years, there have been better quality studies using more modern patient-reported outcome uh, scoring systems. Yao showed, uh, well, Yao had a uh, randomized prospective study that did not show any difference in uh, complications or patient-reported outcomes at one year. Uh, Lee had a study in American Journal of Sports Medicine, a non-randomized study, uh, once, but showing um, no difference in patient reported outcomes between these two groups with significant improvement uh, from their baseline. And uh, earlier this year, uh, Wu and Zheng uh, had once again comparative studies um, showing essentially no long term or short term differences in patient reported outcomes or complications between these two groups, although Wu's study showed that the arthroscopic bursum actually had significantly less perioperative pain. In addition, these clinical studies are, are anatomic studies, one by Draco showing the uh, structures at risk for, the, for this procedure, uh, mainly the superficial perineal nerve and the peroneus tertius. Acevedo um, mapped out what is considered the safe zone. I'll show that in the next slide. And there are, are biomechanical studies showing essentially no difference in stiffness or load to failure between an open and arthroscopic prostrum, as well as no difference in uh, strength with, with regard to anterior to posterior translation. So this is the arthroscopic technique um, described by Acevedo and Mangone. Uh, the safe zone here is between the superior margin of the perineal tendons and the superficial perineal nerve. You have, you're going to have about four centimeters of space there. You'll mark out the distal fibula, and then approximately one and a half centimeters distal of that is the inferior extensor retinaculum. Uh, this technique uses standard anterior medial and anterior lateral portals. So when doing your scope, the only difference between this and a regular scope is that you're going to spend a little more time debriding the uh, anterior aspect of the fibula. You really want to get all the soft tissue off and maybe get down to a little bit of bleeding bone. Um, so through the anterior lateral portal, your anterior medial portal is your viewing portal. The anterior lateral portal, you will place uh, your anchors. The first one is about one centimeter proximal to the tip of the distal fibula, and your second one is one centimeter proximal to that first one. And Feng showed uh, earlier this year that um, there's a significant improvement in patient-reported outcomes when two anchors are used as opposed to one, and in the two-anchor group, there's a, high, a significantly higher um, return to uh, pre-injury physical activity. So uh, after placing the, anchors, uh, placing the anchors in the sutures, the sutures will be coming out of the lateral portal over here. Uh, you'll, you'll, shuttle the, um, you'll shuttle the first limb of the distal suture. Uh, oops, sorry about that. Just dorsal to the perineals right over here. So this is our uh, uh, shuttling device or suture lasso. You're going to pull the, the suture through the hole here and then pull it out distally, as you see here. And then the second, the second limb of the first anchor is going to be uh, pulled out the same way, but just dorsal to the first. And then this is, this is what it looks like after you pull uh, both uh, 
uh, sets of sutures through. In this animation over here, uh, you create a small stab incision between, between the two um, sets of anchors, and then you'll pull the suture through this small stab incision, and you can do your tying uh, with the foot and a little bit of, uh, with, the, with the foot and dorsiflexion and eversion. And uh, using a knot pusher uh, can help, but this can be uh, tied with a surgeon's knot. Um, if you're used to doing shoulder arthroscopy or uh, um, arthroscopic tying techniques, you can use a sliding knot as well. This next uh, picture here on the left is a pre-repair. Uh, there's a lot of motion there. On the right is after the repair, so you can see there's a lot less motion. So this is just a clinical picture. These are two totally different types of patients. Uh, six months on the left after arthroscopic uh, Brostrom, really not much in the way of uh, scarring. On the right, six months, I don't think this is a bad result at all. There's a, a small scar here, but when you're a 17-year-old girl, um, you really don't like that scar. So my indications would essentially be the same for an arthroscopic Brostrom as it would be for a regular open Brostrom. Contraindications, however, include uh, large, large patients, either a high-demand athlete uh, or a laborer, uh, someone who's failed a previous surgery, someone with ligamentous laxity, or someone who has a large perineal tendon tear. Uh, I think if the, the tear is quite big, uh, the best way to access it through is that, that extensile incision. Uh, Dr. Kennedy is going to talk about nanotechnology uh, soon, and, and maybe there's something in there that uh, we can learn uh, how to fix these um, uh, endoscopically. So, Malfouli uh, had a paper in 2013, which had long-term follow-up of 42 higher-level athletes who had underwent the Brostrom, and uh, pretty much all of them got better. However, there was a fair number who uh, didn't do quite as well as one would think, and when looking at all of them, less than 60% actually returned to their same level of activity at that nine-year mark, and um, a little more than a quarter of them abandoned sport completely. So, you know, looking at this one study, I'm not saying that the modified Brostrom is not a, a, good, a good surgery, but perhaps um, the, the right questions are not being asked. Like, are, is, this, is this surgery allowing an athlete to return to his or her level of function? So another question is, well, when, when can we start physical therapy or motion? Uh, there's been a trend now to get people, get joints moving. It's good for uh, cartilage health. It's good for ligaments, uh, but Waldrop showed in a 2012 uh, anatomic study that the repaired ATFL, whether you're using sutures or, an a or just regular sutures or, or anchors, had half the strength of a native ATF ATFL at point zero, so at the time of surgery. Kirk also showed in an anatomic study that the repaired ATFL had significantly more elongation at the repair site when motion was unprotected. How can we make this better? Um, in the past five to 10 years, the, uh, there's uh, been more uh, thought into what's called suture tape augmentation. Now, the purpose of this is not to replace tissue. So if you have a, a patient with very, very poor tissue quality or quantity, then you're gonna wanna try some type of allograft or autograft reconstruction. The purpose of this is to protect the ATFL during the healing process. Um, so veins in a study in 2014 showed that uh, the suture tape plus the brostrum had uh, load to failure of 250 newtons as opposed to a, na uh, a native ATFL, which was a little more than half of that, and then the brostrum alone, which was a half of the native ATFL. So what are the indications for this uh, technique? Uh, you want to think about using it on large patients, obese patients, uh, high-demand athletes, uh, construction workers, people who are on ladders. Um, other indications may be people who failed previous surgery or have generalized ligamentous laxity. Uh, that's controversial. And your contraindication for me is, is essentially someone with uh, uh, poor tissue quantity or quality. So in terms of the technique, the, the, set, the setup is the same as an open brochure. The incision is the same. 
I'll make a percutaneous incision right at the distal aspect of the inferior uh, perineal retinaculum and then would drill the, uh, the talus limb of the implant right at the junction of the neck and lateral body of the talus. You have to direct this drill about 45 degrees towards the mid talus and dropping your hand a little bit so the, so the, uh, the um, drill doesn't get into the subtalar joint. So if you haven't done this, maybe for the first couple of use fluoro, just to make sure your drill is in the right spot. So we'll place the, uh, the anchor in with the suture tape, and then I'll pull the suture tape in between the extensor retinaculum and the ATFL uh, beneath it. So at that point, you finish your brostrum like you normally would. I'm not gonna use as many uh, anchors or implants because it would be too expensive and there's only a limited amount of space on the, on the fibula. I'll typically use two anchors, uh, I'll drill the bone tunnel for the fibular portion of the um, implant posterior to these two anchors. So here's our anchors anteriorly. Here's the uh, drill hole for the uh, other part of the implant. And I'll place a clamp between the suture tape and the fibula. So when you're, when you're uh, securing the suture tape, it, you, don't, you don't make it too tight. So the pros for this is a stronger construct. It uh, it will it should protect the uh, the tissue as it heals. Uh, you should be able to have a accelerated rehab, uh, meaning earlier weight bearing and range of motion, and, and theoretically earlier return to sport. Uh, it's not particularly technically demanding, and it really doesn't increase your surgical time that much. So the cons, well, we don't have much in the way of, of long term follow up, and then there's always the uh, the specter of uh, increased cost. So in my, my physician-owned outpatient surgical center, this is what it costs. It's about $1,000 for one of those. Um, but if you compare it to an allograft, I don't think an allograft is that much less. So where's the evidence? Coxie has the largest study. It's uh, 81 patients, one year follow-up, and they under all underwent an accelerated rehab protocol. And uh, there was a significant improvement in patient reported outcomes and favorable functional comparisons to the contralateral limb. Uh, Zush had a retrospective uh, uh, study comparing modified brostrum versus the suture tape augmented brostrum. And the augmented group had higher patient reported outcomes. And, and Cho had two studies, one showing good results with the suture tape augmented uh, modified brostrum for patients with ligamentous laxity and another for patients who have uh, are in a revision brostrum situation. Post-op protocol, um, if I'm doing an open procedure, they're going to be in a splint. I have non-weight bearing in a splint for 10 to 14 days. If it's arthroscopic, I'll drop that back to maybe seven days. Uh, they're going to progress to weight bearing as tolerated in that second two to four weeks, uh, working on range of motion and strengthening. Uh, once they're full weight bearing, they're going to move over to an air cast do low impact cardio, ankle specific exercise, and then hopefully return to sport in three to six months. So in conclusion, the modified brostrum is, the open modified brostrum is a reliable surgery with good overall results. This, however, is not a reason to be complacent. Um, there's always ways to make things better. The trend in orthopedics now is for arthroscopic or minimally invasive procedures, and that's in all subspecialties. And in general, this has been for the benefit of the patient. Arthroscopic modified brostrum yields equivalent results to an open brostrum in the correct patient uh, with advantages of decreased pain, uh, post-op swelling, and cosmesis. And suture tape augmentation can be of benefit in certain patient po po populations. Thank you very much. Great uh, talk, Carrie. And uh, we have a couple of questions from the audience. We're running a little bit behind, so we won't take too many. But the first one is from the eminent uh, Dr. Shestier. And he'd like to know uh, why the arthrobrostrum is called the arthrobrostrum when it actually isn't a brostrum. It really is just an arthrogould. And I would uh, uh, share his sentence. Well, I mean, you are, you are capturing a portion of the ATFL. Um, and in addition to that, I mean, it's, it's – uh, technically, it's not all arthroscopic, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're tying the, the knots um, – outside of the joint. So it's almost like a mini open procedure. Um, but 
you definitely are grabbing some of the ATFL. In addition to that, with the inferior, re inferior extensor retinaculum, that has a role in stability of the subtalar joint. So you're actually uh, tightening up the uh, subtalar joint or stabilizing the subtalar joint as well. For sure. And I think it's one of those things, it was, uh, so Graham Apley, who was president of the BOA many years ago, um, he said, it must be remembered that the average orthopedic surgeon is an average orthopedic surgeon. And I think, therefore, that this procedure is, you know, very well and excellently done in your hands and in Jorge Acevedo's and, um, and others. Um, but it may not be something that everybody should be doing because there is a risk, even in Peter Mangone's uh, study, that four or five of his patients got a neurisis either from the SPN or from the anterior dorsal branch of the sural nerve. So even though there's this apparent safe zone, it may not be as safe um, as we hoped it would. So I, I think your talk was really excellent. It showed the, the relative merits of the old uh, procedure, which is still one that I, I tend to do. Um, and it showed the merits of the arthroscopic. And we're trying to make that better uh, to make it applicable for, for everybody's use. But you've done a, a, a very um, wonderful job elucidating the, the pros and cons of both. But I think in the interest of time, we'll probably have to move on. Unless, Dr. Schoen, do you have anything uh, to add? Do you, is there anything that you do in particular? Well, I, I feel that the uh, Brostrom, with its modifications, like the Carlson, I think is a very good reproducible procedure, as you say, with the standard orthopedic surgeon and uh, techniques and technology. I think it's cost effective, and we I don't know if we have enough of a case to convert everybody to the arthroscopic technique, but um, I think we have great results with the uh, the open, and I think for certain cases, the endoscopic technique is uh, perhaps a, a, a big breakthrough. Excellent. And so uh, without further ado, we're going to move on to Yoshi Shimazono. Yoshi has been a uh, research fellow for several years with us now. He's terrific. He's published many, many interesting and impactful articles. He's going to talk to us today about osteochondral lesions of the talus. Thank you very much, Yoshi. Thank you so much for introducing me. I'm going to talk about the uh, osteochondral region of the talus. Oh, it's not working. So I have nothing to disclose. So first I'm going to talk about basic pathology. We know that congruent joint has a thin cartilage. The ankle joint is the most congruent joint in the body and has a thinnest cartilage. Also it has the highest compressive modulus. And cause of all is mostly trauma, direct trauma from ankle sprain or fractures or epithelial micro trauma from ankle instability. We know that there's an association of OLT and ankle instability. The ankle sprain is the most common injury. 27,000 ankle sprains occur every day in the United States. Of those, up to 50% result in cartridge injury. In unstable ankle, cartridge contact strains increase significantly. A recent study by Dr. Wang showed the chronic instability increased the risk of OLT, and 40% of chronic instability patients had OLT. So OLT is recognized as a common pathology. The location of the lesions. Traditionally, the posterior medial and anterior region are thought to be the common locations, but recent studies show there's more central region, medial and lateral. We often see subcontinent bone cysts. There are some updates on this pathology. Historically, we believe that it's caused by the breaching of the subcontinent bone plate by synovial fluid pressure, and it's supported by the existence of the communication between cyst and the articular surface. However, it's not from uh, fluid pressure proved by recent studies by Dr. Forte. The cartridge damage or thinning increased focal stress throughout the underlying subcondal bone, and it caused small fracture in subcondal bone, leading to the bone resorption and cyst formation. So cysts will develop due to excess loading in the bone, and it's not from fluid pressure. Treatment options, we orthopedic surgeon always should consider non-operative treatment as first line, non-weight bearing, and uh, activity modification. So there's a study showing that 
asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic lesions do not progress over time when it's treated non operatively. So if it's minimally symptomatic, we can consider conservative treatment. However, for systematic symptomatic lesions, success rate by conservative treatment is very low with uh, 20 to 50%. So typically surgery is uh, required because the cartilage doesn't have the potential to heal itself. So we have many options, cartilage repair, uh, microfracture. We do retrograde drilling if cartilage is intact. Replacement procedure using autograft or allograft, cartridge regeneration, ACI, MACI, but these are more popular in Europe. So today I'm going to focus on microfracture and autograft uh, transfer. So when choosing treatments, there are many controversies. When should we repair or replace? How long will they last? Can we improve the outcomes by using PRP or CBMM? So it's very difficult to make a clear treatment guideline without large group discussion. So we had an international consensus meeting on specifically ankle cartridge in 2017 in Pittsburgh. And we gathered over 100 experts from 26 countries and made consensus statements for ORD treatment. And this statement has been published in Foot and Ankle International in 2018 as a supplement. So if you didn't have a chance to read, please uh, take a look. Okay, let's talk about microfracture. The short-term outcome is very good. Saxena reported good results in that street. Zengering showed 85% success in short-term. But how about mid-term? We, we did a systematic review to see mid-term outcomes. At six years, AOFS score was 89, which is good, but the MR results was not so great only less than 50% had complete filling in the defect, and 80% had surface damage in cartridge. So there's some discrepancy between MRI and the clinical scores. So I pick up some papers looking at MRI findings. Dr. Thurman found that five years, 100% had cracks and fissuring on MRI, and Dr. Becher also found similar findings of uh, surface damage at eight years. And he, he also found 73% had uh, cervical bone alterations. In terms of clinical scores, Dr. Falco found deterioration over time. Mm -hmm. So uh, microfracture looks good in short term, but in reality, the quality of repair tissue is not good on MRI and clinical scores will go down over time. In a recent study in JBJS, Dr. Yang performed a cephalonic scope at 3.6 years after microfracture. Even this short term, 36% had incomplete repair tissue, which you can see at the bottom of this figure. Also, uh, they reported a mismatch between MRI and scope findings, which means that actual cartridge is worse than what we see on MRI. So we need to be very careful about how we evaluate the MRI. Then how about long term? There are three main papers. Choi reported at seven years, 13% required revision. In another study with 12 years follow up, 33% of patients got one grade increase in arthritis on X-ray, which is significant. And the POLA found at 10 years, 57% of patients had some symptoms such as pain. So, and 33% uh, of patients also got arthritis. So unlike short-term, long-term results are not great. So what is the reason? So region size is one of the key factors affecting outcomes. The traditional cutoff for microfracture was less than 15 millimeter or 150 square millimeters. This came from two studies, uh, Dr. Choi and uh, Chuck Pai Wang, and they are great studies, but they're not enough evidence. So then two years ago, Dr. Ramponi and Dr. Kennedy did a systematic review, and they concluded it should be less than 10 millimeter or uh, 100 square millimeter. And this reached a consensus in the Pittsburgh meeting and currently used as a guideline. Also, we should bear in mind that OCL always involves both cell and cartilage, as in the 
name uh, sorry so we need to look at the entire seconder unit not only cartridge but also subconda bone so let's go back to the basic what is the function of the subconda bone the main role is to attenuate joint loading subconda bone plate provides firm support for cartridge and the uh, underlying trabecular bone has elasticity and absorbs joint loading. The cartridge absorbs only one to 3% of joint loading. So importantly, subconda bone absorbs most of the loading. Considering its function, we have to pay more attention to the subconda bone. This is very impressive pictures from Dr. Fortier, Cornell University. Using micro CT, they looked at subconda bone structure after micro fracture. As you can see, it causes the sclerosis uh, around the hole and channels are all collapsed. And we are destroying or killing the bone by doing micro fracture and losing the important support for cartridge. So, actually, what's going to happen in the subconda bone after micro fracture? So we did a systematic review of animal studies, and we found in 100% cases, we see the abnormalities of the subgondal bone, and it never goes back to the normal after microfracture. So microfracture may create permanent damage to the bone. Then we did two studies to see if there's any association between subgondal bone condition and clinical outcomes after microfracture. The first, we looked at bone marrow edema on MRI, and we often see edema after microfracture as a surgical response, but if it lasts more than two years, it may be pathological sign and be associated with worse outcome. Then in the next study, we developed subconda bone health scoring system to assess bone quality. Using this, we found the subconda bone was not restored after microfracture, and it deteriorated over time. And subconda bone quality was also related with outcomes in the midterm. So if you have bad subconda bone, they can no longer support cartridge enough, then and outcomes will go down. So subconda bone health is important for the longevity of the repair tissue. Here I summarize the why subconda bone damage cause cartridge deterioration. So we damage subcondral bone by microfracture, and we know that microfracture does create type 2 collagen initially, but if the support is insufficient, this new cartridge have, uh, have to do more work, and it degrades into type 1 collagen, and automatically it fails. So without uh, underlying support, any treatment of soft cartridge repair will fail. Again, the preserving subconda bone is the key. So how can we improve outcomes? Should we stop microfracture? I bring two, th two things here. Uh, first, let's diminish subconda bone damage. Second, enhance cartridge and subconda bone repair by using biologics. Typically, we use uh, two millimeter ore uh, for microfracture. But again, Dr. Kennedy showed smaller size, like one millimeter resulting in death trabecular fracture and less sclerosis in micro CT. In another study in sheep model, the cartridge repair was also improved by using smaller ore than larger ones. So diminishing subconda bone damage is also good for uh, cartridge repair. So how about biologics? So we use concentrated bone marrow aspirate at the time of surgery, and many papers report positive effects. The Kim found the CBMA improved BAS and AOFS scores, and Dr. Kennedy found better MRI outcomes with CBMA. The Murphy found it decreased division rate, in which 29% uh, in microfracture and 12% in microfracture per CBMA. So patients can get benefits from uh, CBMA. It also may give some benefits on bone, the yeah, subcolor bone repair. So you can see in the middle of this picture, uh, microfracture induced bone loss. And uh, <coughs> sorry. And 
significant increase of oscillator class density was identified in the microfracture group, so which uh, caused subsequent bone absorption at the bottom of the, this figure. But CDMA counteracted both changes and reduced resorption. So there are so no clinical studies, but this study is very, I think it's important to explain why we use uh, concentrated bone mass here. And this is also an interesting study. In equine model, they compared just CDMA alone with microfracture alone. There's no difference in arthroscopic and histological assessment, but as in the left side of this picture, the microfracture group has subcontinent bone alteration, and the CBMA group had better T2 MRI outcomes. So CBMA alone, uh, without microfracture, produced better results than microfracture arrow. So the results look very interesting and because we may not need microfracture anymore, but definitely we need more studies to determine. I skipped this slide as Dr. Kennedy will talk about it, but uh, we use biocartage as we found it improves MRI outcomes. I'll talk about a little bit about predictors of outcome after microfracture. As I mentioned, uh, size is the most important, but in small region, what uh, we don't know the uh, predictor, what is the predictor? So we did multivariate analysis, and from these variables, uh, age, gender, and containment cyst concomitant surgery, we identified an uncontained region, which means the shoulder region and the cystic region, they are risk factors of poor outcomes. And in uh, FAOS score, the shoulder and cyst region is, has the worst score, and non-shoulder and non-cyst region has the best outcome. So we developed sub-survival curve when dividing into subgroups, the shoulder cyst region and shoulder non-cyst region have a lower survival rate around 50% at 10 years. When we divide in two groups, the shoulder region and non-shoulder region, non-shoulder region had 84% at 10 years, but shoulder region had only 52%. So for these regions, we, we need to consider other treatments such as replacement procedure. So next I'm going to talk about osteochondral autograph transfer. I'm not going to talk about Arograph this time. So this is a surgical video from Dr. Kennedy. We use a major major osteotomy with the chevron type and taking out the lesion and checking bone cysts, preparing the recipient site. We put CDMA and move into the lateral femoral condyle taking out the graft. And we spend long time to press the graft in perfect portion to make smooth surface. And at the end, we put uh, three screws for fixation. So in case of larger regions, we use two grafts with normal type procedure. For shorter regions or at the large region, we use biocartridge to fill the defect. No data has been published yet, but we have been seeing good results for this procedure. So the clinical outcomes of AOT are very consistent among papers. 90% of good excellent outcomes, and the MRI outcomes are also promising. In our systematic review, uh, we found Fair rate was only 1% at midterm, so it's pretty good result. So in athletes, Paul reported 75% satisfaction. In more recent studies, uh, we collaborated with Brazilian professional circle rate, and 90% of them returned to press uh, circle. The James Calder, 87% uh, returned to the spot at pre injury level. So very good result in it as well. Like microfracture, again, we did, uh, uh, we investigated the predictors of outcome and their history of 
previous microfracture and shoulder region in the BMI. So unlike microfracture, region size or uh, cystic region are not predictors in AOT surgery. So previous microfracture negatively affects outcomes of AOT. In this study, we showed that primary AOT had better results than secondary AOT. So we don't know the exact reason, but any previous surgeries may affect subcondal bone condition or may produce some inflammation in the joint. So doctors sometimes tell patients like this, your, your region is large, and, but AOT is relatively invasive, so we can try microfracture first because it's simple, and then if it fails, we can do AOT next. But we should stop this. With the secondary AOT will not be as good as primary LP in this study. So if it's large region, do not try microfracture. So there is also a concern of post of cyst formation, which occurs in 60 to 70% after AOT procedure. But in fact, 90% uh, of patients don't have symptoms. And we do not know the long-term effects of cysts, but many of them reduce over time. And also, the cysts are often seen around the graft, so probably they occur during the process of creeping substitution. Because it's not right underneath the cartilage, uh, it won't be a problem in my opinion. However, we need to explore how we can reduce cyst occurrence. So we looked at data and we found that CVMA reduced the cyst occurrence rate to 46%. So that's one of the reasons we use CBMA. Knee donor set mobility. It's also a concern. And years ago, uh, one single case series was published in the HSM in only 12 patients. 50% had knee pain. But it's a very small study, so we need evidence. We did uh, meta analysis, 28 studies, more than 1,000 patients. We found that, especially in larger studies, the estimated rate of uh, donor-set mobility was less than 5%, which is small. Now uh, we know that it's not a big concern in AOT procedure. Medial myelin osteotomy is often required to approach the lesion. If you put only two screws, like a fracture surgery, fragments can shift up and uh, you will have high myelin rate, 30%. Because osteotomy lines high angles, which is different from typical malleable fracture line, so we should not apply the same concept. So we put one more additional transfer screw to obtain rigid fixation. And there's no evidence of shift of the fragment, and there's excellent cartridge radial restoration on TP mapping MRI. So it's very important to put one more screw at the end of the surgery. This will be the final slide. The placement of the graft should be flush with uh, the surrounding surface. So if the graft is one millimeter proud, contact pressure increases up to around 700%. So this is very critical. So we, we spend a lot of time to make perfect smooth surface. And actually this is the key for the success of AOD procedure. The summary, AOT is indicated for large regions, more than 10 millimeter or 100 square millimeters. Excellent outcomes. Donor type mobility is less than 5%. The previous failed microfracture negatively affects outcomes of secondary AOT. Biologics can improve outcomes. Thank you. Excellent talk once again, Yoshi. Um, I do want to bring one thing up. It, my name appeared on this quite a bit, and um, you're very kind to use it. Um, but the, the truth is that um, this is an enormous amount of work done by the uh, research fellows, by the residents, by students, and by um, our residents in, in NYU. So um, the real thanks and, and gratitude goes uh, to them for producing this massive body of work. There are two areas that I would like to talk to you about, because I think they're very, very important. Um, we don't have any questions yet, so I'll take over um, the lectern, as it were. You talk about adaptive remodeling. Um, now, many of us who are old enough to remember when Nick Van Dyke postulated that it was hydrostatic pressure 
caused by a fissure in cartilage created a subchondral cyst, and ultimately um, the cartilage fell in. So it the initial injury was to cartilage, and the subsequent um, biological response to that uh, was a bony cyst. And you're saying now that you feel um, through work done um, in, in Cornell that this is more of an adaptive remodeling to a stress rise or a stress reaction in the subchondral plate. Is, is that our new understanding of why we develop subchondral cysts? Yes, exactly. I think it's a new understanding. And uh, so if you have any cartridge damage, you reduce the durability of the cartridge. And if you reduce the durability, always subcondral bone have to do more work and automatically uh, they, they, they cause the adaptive uh, remodeling. Then, so if you have cartridge injury, you always have both cartridge and subcondral bone issues. So that is subcondral bone, that osteochondral region. Excellent. So the focus really from here on in, it shouldn't be just on the cartilage lesion. It should be really, and we tell the residents now that this is like the rafters on a roof. If you put all the nice tiles on the roof, which we say is the cartilage or whatever we're putting in as a scaffold, and they'll collapse unless you have the proper rafters. So the subchondral plate is the uh, analogy to that. Uh, so by restoring the subchondral plate, whatever we put in then as a cartilage analog on top of that um, should have a better chance of survival. So I have a, I have a question uh, from Joseph Waterhouse. Um, He's asking, what is your approach to lateral side lesions? Do you take down the fibula or do you go through an anterior approach of the uh, tibia for lateral lesions requiring an osteochondral defect or a large, uh, or sorry, uh, requiring an, an osteochondral uh, graft? I don't, I don't take out fibula at all. Uh, so there are lots of uh, papers uh, describing the fibula osteotomy approach. But I think if you <coughs> detach the synthesis in the fibra, you cannot uh, put back into normal position. It's very, very difficult. So we use the trapezoid osteotomy. We don't damage any synthesis any ligaments. We just cut the bone uh, in trapezoid shape. And uh, then we can approach uh, lateral region. So we published this article in Futanago International 2016. So I think uh, it's a very, very uh, good approach uh, right. without any damage to the any ligament. And I think that's the important point that it doesn't seem people say this is analogous to a pilon type fracture to the tibial plafond, but of course the energy required to produce a pilon is what does the damage to the cartilage. So a surgical um, osteotomy really does very little damage, and that's been shown by T2 mapping both in superficial and deep zones. So, Yoshi, I thank you once again for an exceptional um, amount of work you put into this and a very, um, a very instructive uh, video. So, we have to move on in the interest of time, and our, um, our next guest is uh, Professor Lou Schoen. And Lou is going to talk about the state of the art in ankle arthroplasty. Um, so thank you very much, Lou, for joining us from uh, from Maryland. Great, thank you very much. Uh, great talk, Yoshi. Uh, thanks also, uh, Carrie. So I will talk about the state of the art in ankle arthroplasty, um, and basically my biggest uh, conflict disclosure is that I'm co-inventor of the Zimmer total ankle trabecular metal ankle replacement, and I have other inventions which are not. Uh, crucial to this talk. I think my biggest, biggest disclosure is that I was uh, trained at the Hospital for Joint Disease uh, right at the time we were uh, affiliated with NYU and, and worked at uh, Bellevue. The uh, reason I went there was for Mel Joss, who was the president of our foot and ankle society and uh, a leader in foot and ankle. He started our journal. Here he is with Ken Morochik. And really, I wouldn't be here without uh, Joss or a guy like Howard Rosen and many of my other wonderful mentors like Victor Frankel, uh, Marty Posner, uh, uh, Wally Lehman, uh, Joe Zuckerman, and uh, many great friends and colleagues that I've uh, known over the years who have really been leaders in orthopedics. It's great a pleasure to be back 
with the team, uh, the NYU team. And uh, I thank you for having me on board. Looking forward to uh, Joe Bosco's uh, year as the COVID president of the academy. Uh, here's Joe Zuckerman and Victor Frankel. And here we are with our current foot and ankle team, Steve Sestier, who's online, uh, who's watching the presentation on the second from the left, and uh, Ken Morochik, uh, former fellow and uh, excellent foot and ankle orthopedic surgeon. So the normal ankle replacement, um, the normal ankle is uh, this uh, demonstrated here in this four-dimensional CAT scan. It's a four-dimensional CAT scan. We use it for cardiac mapping, a project I did at Johns Hopkins University looking at the uh, movement of the ankle under various conditions. And this shows the basic dorsiflexion, plantar flexion over time in the ankle. And you could see that it's a curved joint. And uh, for the most part in dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, without load, you don't have much movement in the subtalar joint complex or the talonavicular complex. The hind foot complex, on the other hand, uh, is below the ankle and it moves uh, into eversion, inversion, as you see from this lateral approach or from this medial approach. The inversion here is noted um, as well. You can see here uh, from a dorsal perspective, notice the rolling of the navicular over the talus head and the shift of the talus uh, as it goes into a, uh, a more varus position, the talus head shifts laterally. And uh, that high foot joint complex, again, uh, is uh, often a part of the equation when we walk, but it dissipates stresses and it really does not contribute much to what we know as predominant dorsiflexion, plantar flexion in a normal joint. Now, once you start to get into an arthritic joint, then the stopping of the dorsiflexion at the ankle joint uh, will start to throw stresses towards the talonavicular joint. And you can see here the buildup of the osteophyte, and oftentimes the arthritis will progress. Uh, as the ankle arthritis progresses, the uh, talonavicular and subtalar joint uh, will uh, progress in its disease as well. So it's kind of a vicious cycle. Now, when you do an ankle fusion, this is the patient that I fused, you can see the screws through the ankle joint, and you see that immediately, this is three months after I, I took those patients out of a frame because I did it for an infection purposes, um, and I took the patient out of the frame, I did this dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, you can immediately, immediately see that the talus is not dorsiflexing, of course, but that the foot is dorsiflexing through a kind of hinging that's occurring at the subtalar joint and a rolling over at the talonavicular joint. And this is the contribution of the hind foot to dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. And it does do about 15 to 20 degrees of motion that we mapped out here, but it is at a toll of being non-physiologic and does uh, increase the rate of wear in those joints. So this is a, a CAT scan, 4D CAT scan of a patient of mine with an ankle fusion over 10 years uh, or before. And you can see the arthritis and the hinging effect of that hind foot joint complex. And this uh, ultimately led this patient to be in a brace because she's a nurse. She did not want to be in a, through another surgery to fuse her hind foot. So the ankle fusion is still... Uh, what most people will do for these ankle arthritis cases. And the uh, indications are infection, as you see here with a frame, uh, bone quality. You see this case where I had uh, 4,000 screws put in. Uh, neuropathy, uh, this is a Charcot case where the bone is very unpredictable. The patient's neuropathic. They have a lot of mechanical stresses. A fusion is going to be very much in order here. And if a patient is older, we may say that the economic value of doing replacement may not be valuable, or they're going to have too much wear on the replacement, and therefore a fusion will be a better option. But don't forget the older patients, they have balance issues. They may be uh, more senile. They may wander. They may be unstable. So uh, perhaps this is a question. Uh, weight has been an issue. Um, bigger patients have been thought to be better indications for the ankle fusion. But also with the ankle fusion, in a bigger patient, you're going to have more accelerated wear in the hind foot and talonavicular joint. Um, deformity correction. So we have a patient, uh, actually this is a deformity and somebody who's very large. 
uh, and you can see the deformity here and, and the weight of this patient. Traditionally, this would make this patient a candidate for a uh, fusion. Uh, so here's a deformity that's very extreme. You can see the varus on this patient was really uh, way over what we normally uh, would be able to think is doable with a ankle replacement. And here the, the surgeon had tried an ankle fusion on the left. It failed and she rolled in through the subtalar joint through that same mechanism that I showed earlier where she failed and then ended up with uh, supination and varus again. And on the right side, severe varus as well. Uh, so what I had to do here, given her size in the previous uh, surgery, I did a revision of the fusions and realigned her. Um, and that worked well, but she's getting some ankle, hind foot arthritis. So here she is now, and you can see much better uh, mechanics of her gait. Uh, she's not very active, and this is a very good indication for a fusion, but what will happen down the road? So we talked about that hind foot joint getting stressed, and uh, we uh, showed you this and this. So uh, are there other cases where we see even more catastrophic effects of having a fusion? This is a patient of mine who had a fusion and then cracked through the talus neck, has subtalar arthritis, another patient, a sub a ankle fusion. Here you can see the a range of motion that this patient has with an ankle fusion, but this is horribly painful for this patient. And not only is it horribly painful, it's also quite deformed. And you can see the valgus collapse that occurred as a result of that uh, fusion sending stresses to the hind foot joint. Now, what do you do when that happens? Well, then uh, you have arthritis, you have pain, you must fuse it. So you add more fusion mass, and if that still gives the patient pain, then you add even more fusion, and now you're back up to the 4,000 screw, screw thing with progressive limitation and progressive pain. So can we have extended indications for another procedure, like an ankle replacement, and avoid these fusions in only uh, only using for the more extreme cases. So uh, that's uh, where the anchor replacement came in. And these were the first generation anchor replacements. And the classic indications for the replacements were the older patient over 50, low physical demand, no significant comorbidities, no smoking, normal BMI, good bone stock, well aligned, stable hind foot, good soft tissue, no nerve vascular impairment, and reasonable expectation. And in general, when we do a replacement for those patients, we'll have a very nice result, and there's good literature to support that. Now, we've recently, in the latest generation of designs, gone into uh, uh, all, many different models across many companies that have focused on improving the mechanics of the ankle replacements. The Gen 1, 2, and 3 ankle replacements have been improved, so we have bigger implants that were before, now with smaller implants taking less bone volume. This is a study we did um, looking at the resection of bone and looking at a curved resection um, and showing that with this curved resection, we actually had uh, less bone stock taken away and, and therefore uh, leaving more bone behind, more supportive bone with higher density. So if we have less bone resection, as all the newer ankle models have, we have the hopes that we'll have better density to support our implant, and if it does fail, we have more bone to work with to put slightly more metal uh, as opposed to the larger implants like this that was done in the past. This is the agility ankle where when this failed, it had balloon osteolysis. We were already uh, progressively higher and higher up into the leg. So we are now able, uh, unlike what we uh, – worked out with the first and second generation designs, we're now more able to take on more severe deformities. Um, this is the case that I did where this uh, guy had very severe varus deformity and I was be able to do better alignment. Most of the other systems on the market now are able to do a better alignment with less bone resection and the materials have to improve. So we have um, tantalum and titanium. Uh, the cobalchrome molybdenum is the surface that usually bears the weight, and that uh, goes against the polyethylene very nicely. That's pretty standard, but the polyethylene, we've gotten into more highly cross-linked polyethylene, which minimizes wear. This is some wear testing studies uh, we did looking at conventional poly 
versus uh, the um, uh, highly cross-linked poly. And we basically found in this study that we had significantly less articular uh, delamination and backside wear uh, to the tune of about a five-fold improvement. Um, so using the better poly, we're able to uh, get better uh, wear of the poly, and therefore perhaps we will be seeing fewer and fewer cysts and uh, lucency between the bone and the metal. Another study uh, done looking at the uh, uh, finite element analysis, looking at the stronger plastic and does that lead to fracture? And uh, with these modeling, we were able to find that we had better, um, uh, better uh, properties with the uh, highly cross-linked poly. Now, there's been many studies in the last 20 years or so looking at the age of patients. And you could see that this one in 2004, patients less than 40 had a 1.45 greater risk of reoperation and a 2.65 greater risk of implant failure than older patients. That's an older study. With now uh, the newer studies, you see is Rodrigo and Pinto, uh, greater increase in AOFA score and similar rates of survivorship in patients less than 50 over those over than 50. And Dimitri Kompoulos said greater improvement in the SF36 and AOFAS functional scale in less than 55, no difference in pain relief and rates of revision. Other things looking at uh, the size of patient have shown that the size is not as much of an issue as it was thought to be with the newer designs, faring better in heavier patients. Coronal plane deformity, uh, 30 to 45% of patients uh, with ankle replacement uh, who come to ankle replacement will have uh, deformity. And it's uh, greater than 10 degrees and sometimes it's even higher. And with the greater deformities, you can see that uh, in the older studies in JBS 2006, there was uh, with greater uh, than 10 degrees deformity, there was increased failure rate. Well, in the more recent studies, uh, as you see Jacob Zide uh, in uh, 2013, uh, the patients had a better uh, correction and was able to hold the correction with uh, excellent outcomes, even with more deformity. So again, more recent papers showing that you could go into a higher plane of deformity, especially in the coronal plane, and still have excellent results. So we're seeing an improvement in the outcomes with more challenging cases, younger patients, more severe deformity, heavier patients. Now, what about the loss of the hind foot? Does that uh, cause the patient to have increased stresses. Some studies have shown it does show increases stresses at the ankle. Some have shown that the results are as good. The longer term studies will probably show with hind foot fusion that we will still have a higher wear rate in the longer term analysis, 10 years and plus. Steve had that did a meta analysis looking at total ankle and found for the most part really good survival rate, uh, but there were uh, in the the total ankle group, 78% had five-year implant survival rate, 77 had 10-year survival rate, 7% revision rate with loosening and subsidence accounting for 28% of those cases. Only 1% needed BKA with a fusion, 10% non-union, and a 9% revision rate and a 5% amputation rate. So that's a little alarming. But uh, you can see that this was a 2007 uh, using the older design. And I think the newer models have shown progressively better results with uh, fewer complications uh, doing the ankle replacement versus fusion. So uh, basically, uh, with the fusion, although there can be fewer complications, there's greater function that, uh, with the total ankle. Equivalent pain relief and patient satisfaction is better uh, with better overall success in the Saltzman paper. A study uh, out of the uh, Canadian Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Society basically showed that although they had some revisions and fusions of 7%, there was 17% in total ankles. They still had uh, complications in both groups, more with total ankle, uh, and both groups improved, and their studies are now showing progressive improvement in their results with the total ankles versus the fusion. Jasper showed that um, although some that um, a 10 year follow up, 94% had implant survival, 40% needed some additional procedure, most at about nine years. Uh, all patients reported good or excellent outcomes. So, 
Uh, they also say that they have statistically significant improvements in range of motion, walking upstairs, downstairs, uphill at 12 months compared to fusion patients. Economically, a uh, good case has been made for the ankle replacement uh, with a better ability to perform uh, work and higher level function. Uh, we do have the higher cost of the implant. Let me show you some cases quickly. So this is an ankle with a malunion, and you can see this deformity is about a 15-degree deformity. We were able to translate it forward. I milled away the surface, just removing the surface of the bone, and realigned it and was able to correct the sagittal plane. The syndesmotic deformity was corrected. The fibula was corrected, and we had excellent range of motion and stability. Another case here, you can see severe deformity with minimal bone resection, with better tools, better equipment, better implants. We're able to get excellent alignment and maintain the alignment. In my particular cases, I have not lost uh, correction of my deformities. I've been able to take on uh, deformities in multiple planes, planes, including sagittal plane correction, uh, and get them uh, realigned. Here's a case of a guy with a... Um, he is uh, in his 50s. He's got a severe equino varus deformity. He's got uh, retro, um, you know, a, a retropulsion of his knee with recurvatum. When he tries to walk, that ankle forces his knee backwards, and he has severe pain in his knee. He had two failed surgery in the knee. Severe knee valgus as well as the foot in supination, fixed equinus. A very challenging case. If you do a fusion on this guy, he'll be better but he won't restore normal mechanics to his knee, which you can see is highly dysfunctional. Here's his case of multiple levels of deformity. I did the replacement and realigned him. Here he is at three months, and you can watch him walk at three months with no surgeries done at the knee. He doesn't have a lot of dorsiflexion, but he was stuck down in 35 degrees before. Now you can see with one operation, I was able to get his knee properly aligned his lower extremity function has returned to near normal. Although he doesn't have dorsiflexion at the ankle, he at least has a neutral position, and his gait at three months is quite uh, good. Here he is now at, um, at a year, doing better, walking more swiftly, and you can see uh, his mechanics have improved enough that he could recover from a trip. Um, and uh, here he is now at uh, two years, and he's now four years out and doing uh, quite well. So it's a game changer. We do uh, have a lot more to learn. We're doing metal artifact reduction MRIs now, and Jan Frintz at NYU is one of the innovators and champion of this procedure. He's chief of musculoskeletal radiology and a brilliant uh, innovator and technician and thinker and writer, and we are going to be able to look around implants better thanks to his breakthroughs. So in conclusion, ankle joint function is uh, up and down. We do have some tailor side to side. Uh, with ankle arthritis, we have impact not only at the ankle, but at the subtalar joint. Fusion is still effective option for infection, bone quality, neuropathy, age, weight, and deformity. But it uh, does give you some problems if you have uh, the subtalar joint overloaded with time. You can get arthritis and pain. So with the replacements, the modern replacements, we can restore articular anatomy and motion, correct deformity. We have procedures that are more reliable and better. We have more bone preservation. We have better metal, better plastic. We have early follow-ups with the systems, but all things are, report, are, are heading towards uh, a better tool for our patients. So we have to think about the big picture. Uh, and uh, I think with that in mind, we will have continued innovations and improvement in our outcomes. Thank you very much. Lou, that was uh, exceptional. I know you were you were racing at the end, and I appreciate that. Um, and an enormous amount of information in that. Um, one of the things Charlie Salzman um, used to say uh, was that when I think they were using the jersey or one of those the early the second generation, but he wasn't able to get an awful lot more motion um, with an anchor replacement than than the, what they had um, at the start of the procedure. So. Um, in, in now in your sort of third, moving on to fourth generation arthroplasty systems, are you finding that you're able to restore motion in these ankles or just maintain what yeah. was there before? Um, 
in general, the stiffer they are before the replacement, the stiffer they will be after. So we have some patients who come in um, that are very stiff because they have soft tissue and bony problems. Those people tend to be still pretty stiff, but I would say 15 to 20 degrees range of motion improvement is pretty standard. Now, we have other patients who come in, and it's all bony, and even without Achilles release, we could give them back 20 degrees of dorsiflexion and 40 degrees of plantar flexion. It's definitely a subgroup of the people who I, who I call the home run procedures, where they get excellent range of motion, market improvement, maybe a 30-degree improvement. Um, but then there's a lot of patients who have a, a subtle improvement of 15 degrees or 20 degrees, and they're delighted and uh, functional at a much higher level, uh, as you saw a Jasper study, because of their less stress on their foot, the hind foot, their knee, and ability to go up and down slopes and operate foot pedals. Terrific. Well, look, um, I think we have to move on. Again, we're, we're pressed for time. And can you, um, I'm sharing the screen. Can you see the first slide? Yes. And the second slide? Yeah, okay. So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, nanotechnology in the foot and ankle, or needle arthroscopy, as it was previously known. And it's been around for several years. Um, but recently, the, this company has brought out, and I have no disclosures or no financial disclosures that are relevant to this, but this company has brought out a new device. And the device is interesting because it has an ergonomically designed um, handle. It's very, very light, and it's very, very small. It's only 1.9 millimeters in diameter. And the reason it can be so small is because they now have a chip-on-tip technology. So the old fiber optics are out and this chip-on-tip technology is in. And what that does is it provides us with really terrific imaging. This was the um, this is picture here obviously is of the knee, but you can see the meniscus and the femoral condyle um, with greater clarity with a smaller uh, device than you can with the original four uh, millimeter device. So. The reason that's important, well, there's many, many reasons why we think it's important. In this very nice study that was done by the late, great Paolo Galano, he showed that overall, there's over 30% of patients who have an ankle scope will have some form of iatrogenic articular cartilage injury. That's a massive amount. One in three will have some form of cartilage injury. But only, only six or 7% of those are severe. So we think, well, that's not too bad. The problem is, when we look at some work that we collaborate on with Larry Bonassa, the first 500 microns of cartilage are responsible for 90% of joint dissipation of compressive loading. So that means even in those cases that have a small amount of damage, that's very significant downstream because we know cartilage can't repair itself. So that old maximum, first do no harm, and I think these smaller scopes allow us to see and do things without causing this iatrogenic injury. But of course, that's not the only reason. There are many reasons, and we alluded to those earlier on. One of them is that there's just a growing, there's a growing fund of knowledge looking at what's going on around the foot and ankle, particularly not just in cartilage, but in, in ligaments and in tendons and all sorts of structures around there. And these are structures that are amenable uh, to minimally invasive procedures. So the advent of this new arthroscopy device is uh, certainly pertinent and relevant um, to what we're finding. So this is what we use. It's a very simple device. It's a throwaway at this point. Um, and this is a kit that we use in NYU. Um, you can see the kit down on the left. It's very, very small. We also just have um, biters, and we have uh, scissors and graspers, and then we just have a very, very small dressing set for afterwards. So it's a very small set. It doesn't take up a lot of room in a surgery center or anything else like that. So this is the nano instrumentation. It's only two millimeters diameter at the, the tip. So I was a little bit worried about it. So one of our uh, clever residents said, well, let's see how strong it is. And as these were disposable, um, he cut the, the uh, electrical cord going to the nano after the procedure, luckily. And you can see that there's nothing really in the ankle that's gonna be much stronger than that electrical cord. Uh, so it's done very, it, it shows that it's very strong. Now there's new stuff coming online and what we have, typically I like to do a lot of work in osteochondral lesions. So these are new devices. We have all, uh, they're 
different angles. But of course, this is a straight scope. It has a 120 degree field of vision or like a fisheye. Um, so you'd like to be able to get around a curve with some of your instruments. And so we actually have come out with a new device now that will be able to bend those. And so you'll be able to get to where you need uh, to use a curette, um, an elevator, uh, we're using pediatric osteochondral lesions, and uh, even when we need to do small limited microfracture with these all. We're also uh, using these birds. Right now I use a two millimeter bird. It's typically enough, but sometimes when you have large anteromedial impingement lesions, um, you need something a little bit more robust, and so that's coming out shortly. And we're also bringing out a power pick, which will uh, be a little bit more controlled in terms of microfracture. The nanosuction biter was developed by some of the hand surgeons, and I think it's a very nice tool, um, not only in terms of the foot and ankle, but also in the knee to do uh, many uh, meniscectomies with it. So this is what we're really talking about. The ability to see, and not only the ability to see, but the ability to do in, in, in the operating room or in your surgery center or in bedside. So MRI is here to stay. We're not going to try and supplant that, but what we want to do is improve on, what the, on the sensitivity of MRI. So I like to see osteochondral lesions, and that can determine the quality of the cartilage that's there. I can also look at impingement, both soft tissue and bony, um, as a dynamic study. We can look at subtle insynosmotic instability. We can look at ankle fracture reduction, and also pain of unknown origin, which we often, uh, we often encounter. The things that we can do are just as important. So any loose bodies, synovitis, osteophytes, anterior impingement, and even our osteochondral lesions that are smaller than 10 millimeters, we can address at bedside now. And we've just been working on inside-in technique for ATFL repair. How do you do it? It's exactly the same setup as if you were going to do this in the operating room. Um, you identify your landmarks. You identify the SPN before you do anything. And I just insufflate about 10 minutes beforehand with lidocaine and marcaine into the uh, portals and into the joint. And we put a little bit of um, epi into that to prevent any bleeding. We don't use uh, tourniquets at all. And then we do the same thing, nip and spread technique into the, uh, into the portals. And then we advance our medial side first and then our lateral side. We put the pump at relatively low flow, 35 millimeters. And then we can do that, as I said, in the operating room or in your um, bedside here. This is what we do in NYU. We were the first, I think, uh, certainly in the Northeast, and I would hasten to say possibly in the world, uh, to do this. And you can see it's very, very easy. The patient there is looking. You can see this pre-COVID. There's no mask, but he's, uh, he's looking at what's going on within his ankle and quite content to do so. So the, I'm going to go through, I think a couple of cases are always more interesting than just talking about the device itself. And of course, the first person to have this done was a very dubious character, a balding middle-aged male, ex-rugby player, um, who had multiple knee traumas. And this is um, what Dr. Schoen found inside his um, ankle. This is severe degenerative changes. Um, so this is a harbinger of poorer things to come for this poor fellow, um, but at least he knows. And, um, and it's can address that with biologics before he gets an arthroplasty. So the second case was a 65-year-old female. She'd pain over the anterior aspect of the ankle. She'd live in a dorsal section, um, and it exacerbated pain. And nobody could find anything. And she came to us as the last hope. This was her MRI, and it wasn't very remarkable. There was nothing there that we could really identify other than a little bit of cicatrization of the anterior aspect of her joint. So we put the scope in, and the first thing, the very first thing that we saw um, was this bony exostosis or loose body indeed as it become at the front of her ankle joint. And that was moving around, uh, causing all this inflammation and pain when she dorsiflexed. And uh, once we removed it, and then she was much better. In fact, she walked right out. Um, and within a week or so, she was very, very happy. So 40-year-old male, status post oath procedure of the tail is uh, five years ago. And now he has pain at the anterior aspect of the ankle joint. And we find this a lot with those who have a medial malleolar osteotomy. About five to 10 years after surgery, they come back with a little bit of anteromedial impingement. This didn't seem too bad. We didn't do an AMI view on this. But you can see there's a little bony protuberance and mostly soft tissue. So we did an in-office uh, procedure. Uh, this is when we go in. You can see a lot of fronding, synovial hyperplasia. 
and a lot of scar tissue. This is the uh, TRIO resector we're using right here. And it's very effective for removing this. And the patient has no pain whatsoever. He's looking at this all the time. This is on the lateral side. He's a hypertrophic uh, AITFL. We use the biter to get rid of the anterior band of that. And now we're just advancing in to look at his old oats graft, which you can see there's a little bit of fibrillation, um, but uh, on uh, probing, it's quite stable still. The next case is a 33-year-old male, and he had multiple lateral ankle ligament surgeries, and he's now in pain over the subtalar joint and perineal tendons. And again, it was a little bit of a last uh, for him, and nobody really could come up with what was going on, and neither could we. This is his MRI, which shows there's a massive scar tissue over the lateral aspect. You can see multiple previous surgeries have been performed here, but nothing that necessarily hits you as a, as a, a primary diagnosis or primary pathology here as to why this young guy can't run. Again, we said, well, the best thing to do is to have a look. Not only can we have a look, but hopefully uh, we can also address what's going on here. Now, what you're looking at is the perineal tendon. That's the perineus brevis. Um, we have this little hook behind the uh, CFL and the subtalar joint. And you can see all this scar tissue uh, caused him some stenosis of the perineus brevis. And once that was removed, um, then he got back and he's now a, an active member of the FBI. Next case is an interesting case, a 22-year-old female. And just the other day, she posted online a very nice picture um, of all of us. Uh, she's very happy with her um, with her procedure because of this. She'd spent years and years um, not been able to do the things that she wanted to do because she had a Salter Harris type two growth plate fracture um, as a teenage gymnast. Since that time, she had multiple surgeries uh, to address her deltoid, her posterior tibial tendon, and none were successful. And so we didn't know whether we could help her an awful lot, but we do have an ultrasound in the office, and this is what we're able to find. And you can see on the uh, right side of the screen is normal pathology for the posterior tibial tendon, and it's in this shallow groove. Uh, by contradistinction, when you look on the affected side, you can see that there's an overgrowth, most possibly by that um, zone of Ronbier that uh, Shapiro talks about in and around the uh, growth plate, and it's created this hypertrophic uh, scarring and hypertrophic bony protuberance, and our posterior tibial tendon was becoming inflamed in there. So, what we did, we brought her to the uh, to our treatment room, and you can see there's her posterior tibial tendon, and we're now shaving away that bony protuberance, and they were getting through the periosteum first of all, and we shaved it away, and she was happy for the first time in many many years. So something that's relatively difficult to to diagnose, um, but relatively easy to treat. Um, but certainly the nanoscope can give us that ability. As a 34-year-old male with um, recalcitrant non-insertion Achilles tendinopathy, he'd failed shockwave, and uh, we brought him to the operating room. And you can see this massive amount of scar tissue between the paratenon and the tendon itself. Uh, we know that the paratenon contributes to a lot of the inflammatory uh, pain that these people get, as does the plantaris on the medial side. And we resected both. Um, so in other words, we debride all around the tendon and resect a little segment of the plantaris and... Uh, and this chap got back to doing his normal activities. This is an interesting case, 63-year-old female. She had a hydrogel implant in her first MP joint for end-stage um, hallux rigidus, but she had persistent pain. And we can see that uh, one month postoperatively that the hydrogel implant is not looking terrible, but at five months, it's really looking uh, as close to catastrophic as you can get because now it's created uh, counter surface where it's loose and so we she didn't want a fusion so we wanted to have a look at this so this again was done in the office so you're looking at her first MP joint and uh, we're just shaving up some of this but you can see the gross destruction of the joint itself and you'll see just in here is a polyvinyl insert um, and then you're going to see how it's now almost counter sunk where it should be proud and the damage that it's done on the um, phalang phalangeal counter surface. This is an interesting chap. He, uh, the triathlete, he, does, he did seven triathlons in seven continents in seven days. He's also an investment banker, so he can afford his own plane to fly to these places. Uh, but he came into us with this osteochondral uh, defect a few years ago. And so we tried 
bicartage. A bicartage, as Dr. Shimizono talked about, is an extracellular matrix. We use it as a scaffold um, in osteochondral defects, and then we seed that with concentrated bone marrow aspirate, which has stem cells and growth factors. And it creates this secretome or this biological milieu in the area, which promotes um, cartilage. Um, and that's the theory. Um, but it didn't work very well, and this is because it came back with pain. And this is a second look nanoscope, again, in the office, looking at the biocartage. And you can see it's fibrillated and it's degraded. And um, so this is just a couple of years afterwards, and it really hasn't done well. And he subsequently went on to um, have a, he required an oats graft. But again, MRI didn't pick this up. MRI said there was uh, substantial infill. And so MRI is very, very useful, but uh, certainly nano can fine-tune what we're looking at. This is a 23-year-old female. She had an ostrigonum resection, and then she came into us with persistent um, ankle pain, the posterior aspect of her ankle joint. Um, and this, again, it, you can see the setup in the office. Uh, very, very simple. We do a posterior scope with the patient in a prone position. And this is what we found. Once we got in there, you can see this big a um, glob of scar tissue right there at the subtalar joint and ankle joint, and there's her FHL running right adjacent to it, and you can see um, that has become scarred and stenosed at the back there, so we clear everything out of there very carefully because obviously a little bit anterior and medial to that is an neurovascular bundle, and we'll be able to see that the passage of the FHL is now clear. We go down in and around the medial mile just to see how clear it is, and it looks absolutely normal down there. And again, all of this is done in the office showing the patient. This is another patient, 42-year-old male or female. She came in with uh, MTP joint pain after a, a marathon, and um, everything looked normal on MRI, everything looked normal on X-ray, and uh, this is what we found. We put the scope in, and you can see she has a very large chondral uh, defect in there. We're able to shave, put in a, a, a three millimeter shaver, and this is the chondral defect. You can see that's where it came from. Um, so again, there's not an awful lot you can do to prolong the life of this joint. Um, this is a joint in danger, but certainly it's a very useful thing to be able to give at least the patient the prognosis that's more realistic. Uh, this is a chronic insertional or Haglund's uh, deformity, and again, we can use this in the office setting uh, to resect them. For some reason, this video is not working. But again, we do the same thing for a posterior portal, and we're able to take away that hagland and debride the tendon where necessary. And we wanted to look into the sesamoid. Sesamoid, for me, is a, is, a, is a joint that I don't love because it's difficult to know what's going on in there. So we brought it to the lab, and we're very lucky in NYU to have a, a terrific lab that we can identify and work ahead of things so we can see what we're doing. So this on the, on the left is the lab, and on the right, is actually the uh, sesamoid when we actually got in uh, to the joint itself. And you can see that it's maltracking. Um, and it's just like the uh, patellofemoral joint and that the patient had a chondromalacia here. And we're able to deal with that by injecting a biologic. And the patient so far, at about three or four weeks out now, seems to be doing reasonably well. So I know we don't have an awful lot of time, so we'll, we'll summarize. A needle arthroscopy uh, can facilitate the diagnosis of intraarticular pathology in a simple bedside procedure under local anesthetic. Uh, the simplicity of the procedure allows the patient to observe their own conditions, and I think that's one of the most important things about this. Um, one of our uh, residents at the moment, uh, Dr. Colasanti, is, is calling our patients, and the, the feedback that we're getting from anteromedial impingement patients is, that they love to see what's going on in there because they can buy into their recovery a lot better than if I come out and tell them after anesthesia what I've done because they can truly see it and understand um, how they can grade their own, or how they can titrate their own rehab based on what they've seen. So not only do we have the ability to see, obviously we have the ability to do a lot of things also now with different shavers, biters, graspers, et cetera. And I think a whole different talk will be on the biological augment and that we can deliver in a precise fashion uh, to this area of interest. So I won't delay any longer, and I will hand it back to um, Lou, who will ask questions on this as I try and navigate my way out of the uh, screen table. Great talk, John. Um, so, uh, John, the question that some people might ask is, this: will this supplant 
uh, interoperative uh, proper uh, arthroscopy. I mean, we're doing it in the office. Uh, now, will this technique supplant it, or is it just going to be a kind of more minor procedure on the way to a, the more a formal arthroscopy? Um, it's a great question, and I think it'll do both. So I think um, many patients just don't have time and the energy to wait around for a diagnosis on, on things. And so it's not, we're not trying to take away from our MRI uh, colleagues at all. I think there are many patients that come in that have been to several other doctors. They have many MRIs, and none of it's giving the information that we need. And in those cases, um, this is a very good diagnostic tool. In certain cases, not only the diagnostic, but we can also do things in there for small osteochondral defects, certainly for things that were just taking away stuff, like an os trigonum, like anteromedial and anterolateral impingement. It's really excellent for that because there's no downtime to that. The patient has it done, they get off the table and they walk home. For larger lesions, um, either from osteochondral lesions or for larger degenerative tears and so forth, then I think we need better visualization and distraction so we can get in at the back of the joint properly. So I don't think it's going to supplant everything we're doing in an operating room with larger, um, with larger equipment, but I think it will augment it and will in, in, I think it'll just enhance the whole field of um, arthroscopic visualization because large caliber um, scopes just aren't very effective at looking into small tendon spaces. So we're able to look now into um, into, the, into perineal tendons, into posterior tibial tendons, Achilles, and so forth. So it's, I mean, tomorrow I'll be looking into a joint of a lady who has a um, plantar plate injury of the second MP joint. And we're going to be able to go in there, we're going to be able to debride the plantar surface of the uh, proximal phalanx with a nanoscope and see that with concentrated bone marrow aspirates allowed to heal um, without, without creating an incision and, um, or without creating a large incision. So I think for those things, um, you know, the world's are just there's so much more that we can do with this. I think we're just at the very beginning of it. Yeah, uh, John, I've been very impressed with it to, because the flexible scope, I was actually able to go posterior to the tibial plafond, um, going back almost to the back of the ankle joint without even using just uh, any uh, traction other than just manual distraction. I got in with a nanoscope and saw beautifully what I couldn't see with a, a, a rigid scope. So I think there's a lot of, you showed some great cases, there's a lot of indications here. Perhaps we could cut to the chase with our imaging and maybe get, offer people not only a better image of what they have, but also get them on the road to treatment uh, in one office visit, as opposed to coming back with an MRI and then scheduling a bigger surgery. So. Hats off for you for innovating in this space, and uh, hopefully our patients all continue to benefit from its use in the office and in the OR. Thanks, Lou. I've actually lost the ability to get back into the uh, the chat room, so um, I okay. will turn it over there, to you if, if one, there's any questions. There. Yeah, there was one question from Steve Seshgear. Um So, yeah, Steve actually, you know, we love Steve. He's always very insightful, but he's asking questions. What about liability? So if you do an office procedure, do you have some liability? Um, if you do a diagnostic, maybe not so much, but if you do something surgical, are you, you know, putting yourself at risk? Interesting question, and I think, uh, John, what, what do you have to say? Um you know, honestly, I haven't been asked that question before. It hasn't come up. Um, it is an interesting question. It's one I don't have a good answer for, and um, I've learned that the best people to answer legal questions are probably lawyers. And uh, so <laughs> I would um, ask Steve to contact his, uh, his malpractice <laughs> agent, and he'd probably be better able to answer that. I don't know. I mean, the, the reality is that this is a um, – it's the diameter of a large needle. Um, so certainly diagnostically, it's not doing anything more um, than putting a needle into a joint, which we are covered to do. Um, so I don't right. see any problem. But again, I don't have the um, I don't have the exact statement on that. Yeah, yeah. My my sense was if you uh, 
the way I would think my attorney would answer is if you have the proper setup, proper equipment, proper sterility, um, then I think you're in good shape. I think it, it, there is a boundary, uh, and I think a more aggressive surgical procedure um, probably would uh, put you in the gray zone, but something more simplistic like a shaving or a biopsy would be uh, totally uh, within the scope of what we do. Um, and, uh, you know, general, general practice guys do bone marrow biopsies in the office. Um, you know, there are, there are aggressive biopsy procedures done with, I think, pretty high risk in the office uh, all the time throughout the medical system. So uh, interesting question. Uh, thank you for your, uh, your, your insightful uh, challenge, Steve. Any other questions? Terry, have you had a chance to use the nanoscope? I haven't used it. I'm certainly interested about it. I'm kind of afraid to do it in the office. Um, and I actually, I think I, I tried to post the question. My question was, um, I mean, do you have to go through the normal authorization process to do this? Or the patient just shows up and, and uh, you know, if someone comes in with 15 different studies and nothing shows anything and, and you decide you want to do this procedure, do you just do it or do you have to get authorization to do it? Um, again, Don. that question, yeah, it, it's a it's a terrific question and, and very pertinent, um, particularly in this day and age. And and so we are trying to get authorizations uh, where necessary or where required. Uh, but sometimes patients will have a deductible if they go for an MRI and have to pay to go there anyway. And they say, well, look, let's just crack on. We don't charge this as a um, as a surgery. It's charged as a, a small procedure. So um, in that regard. It's a, it's a little bit of a gray area, but certainly I, I would try and get um, insurance authorization before I would do anything. And, and what about antibiotics? So even though we, you know, technically we don't have to use um, antibiotics when we're doing arthroscopy, I, I, I typically do. What about in the office? I mean, you're you're technically going in the joint and looking around and, and doing a, an invasive procedure. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the most important thing is, you know, when we say office, it's not the, you know, there's people walking in and out and... Yes, and, I, um, yes. Yeah, and so it's... Everything that we do is under sterile conditions. Um, we're all dressed in, in the appropriate um, sterile gowns and so forth. So it's, it, it's, it replicates as closely as possible a standard um, operating room. And... You're absolutely right. The biggest problem with any innovative technique is the first time you get an infection, all sorts of naysayers will jump on you and say, well, that should never have been done in the office anyway. So we are very, very fastidious about um, our surgical technique. And we, are, we also put patients on um, just three doses of uh, broad spectrum um, antibiotics. Just for that reason alone, is just more of a prophylactic than anything else. We haven't had, and Murphy's Law now, but I'd say we, we certainly, to the best of our knowledge, we haven't had any infective things. And, and in large part because the surgical trauma is so small, and we're not creating uh, multiple tissue planes, and this is less than a two millimeter incision. Um, so it really is, in terms of any contaminants from the skin floor, um, there is a it's almost like a little switching stick that you can put in uh, to reduce that risk if you're worried about it. Um, but it, you know, again, just think it's been it's been constantly washed out um, with the fluid. We there's two ways of doing this. You can put it onto a pump, which I do, um, or you can actually put a little lure lock on and you can put a um, 20 cc syringe and just manually. Um, insufflate the um, the joint that way, but it's a, that's a little bit tedious. So putting it on a, a simple uh, pump is a lot easier. Okay, I think thank you. in answer to your question, there are many many things that we have to work out in terms of the uh, logistics, um, but the actual technical aspect of this, um, I don't want people to be worried or, or afraid about this. This is a simple arthroscopy, and it's so simple because it's much smaller than standard arthroscopy. So you're going to do less damage, and all of them have done damage to joints, putting in um, you know, the joints that are difficult to get into. Um, you'll do less damage, you'll see more, and you'll have the ability to do a lot of things that you wouldn't otherwise have been able to do 
And um, and so we use it in the operating room as well. This is not just that we bring patients into the back room. Uh, we use nanoscopes now universally for posterior scopes because I can get into the subtalar joint without any form of distraction. I use it in, in many, many anterior um, ankle arthroscopy, again, because I don't need any distraction. Um, but now and again, you'll need the, the standard scope, particularly if you're going to be doing large osteochondral lesions or if there's a massive amount of uh, bony growth where you know that you'll have a shaver that's taking a lot of uh, debris away. So that they're really sort of, again, as, as I was saying to Lou, I think it'll augment and help with what we do in the operating room rather than detract or take away from it. That, I totally take agree with that. Go ahead. Go okay, ahead. well, I think uh, we, we've, we've kind of, um, we've certainly gone over our time, and I just want to thank all our speakers and all the people behind the speakers um, who have put in all the um, the, the man hours and uh, to do this work. Um, so thank you very much, and thanks also to the, uh, to the audience who stayed with us to the bitter end, and uh, just wish you all a good night and, uh, and all the best.